the One Percenter Podcast with Sam Bakhtiar, bringing you the one percent knowledge to help you reach your full potential. Learn what it takes to rise above the ninety-nine percent and become a one percenter. Hey everyone, what's going on? Welcome to the One Percenter Podcast. It's your home, Sam Bakhtiar. I got my long, long time friend, the very successful. Guillermo Haro on the show. What's up, buddy? What's up, brother? How are you? Thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, I appreciate you. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you so much for being here, man. I, really quick, you know, we've known each other for a little over 20 years, you know, and, and uh, we didn't see each other for a long time until all of a sudden I, you know, ran into you at the Las Vegas airport. That's right. And I didn't even recognize you. <laughs> I mean, you had a major transformation. You know, you were kind of like, you know, on the chunkier side 20 years ago, and now you're like, not only successful as far as financially, but you're, you're successful in all areas of life, which I believe is for you to become a one percenter, you need to have your faith, your family, your fitness, finance, and fun. You know, you have all of that attributes. And you know, the one thing that was always missing was fitness and you got that dialed down. I, man, did you dial it down right now, man. I mean, you are in the best shape of your life, right? Right now? I would say yes. Maybe when I got out of college, I was probably equivalent, but I didn't have the muscle mass or the tonality like I do now. Yeah, so you have more muscle mass. You yeah. have you know, just as good as cardio. Mm-hmm. So how old are you right now? 50. So you're 50 in the best shape of your life, mm-hmm. at the top of your game. I don't want to dig into that. Is that okay? Can sure. I dig into that? Absolutely. So before I dig into that, I know what the first memory of me is with you. Okay. Do you remember that? I think I met you at your gym. Yeah. And um, we had a little brief conversation and then not too much after that. I, I don't know. Okay. I'm going to remind you. I'm okay. going to remind you really quick. So okay. I remember, you know, you came to the gym mm-hmm. and you were sign- you wanted to sign up. You know, you were signing up with some of your, some of your staff and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And you came to the gym and I was, a, I was, I was just a beginning entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. I think I was in like the fourth year of my business and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, you came in and I give you a price of personal training for three months. And you started negotiating hardcore. <laughs> like, like you came in there, Guillermo, you were negotiating hardcore. You were like, hey, man, I want to go. And you sat there and negotiated. And I remember, like, we kind of bumped heads in the beginning a little bit. Because I'm like, who's this guy coming in in a suit, you know, and, you know, th- you know coming here and negotiating on the price of my personal training? Now, so I had a little bit of ego. You had a little bit, a bit of ego. Like, kind of, we were, we were kind, of, kind of clashing a little bit, mm-hmm. right? And then we got you know, reintroduced by a mutual friend, Dan Charlier. Right. You know, we were, we were at, the, I think at the Cabana Room or something like that, or, um, and, and then we became more and more friends, and, and then we didn't see each other, and then we ran, it, ran, ran to each other at the Las Vegas yeah. airport. Well, I didn't see you until you got rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what? <laughs> well, I'm trying to catch up to you, man. You always set a role model, you know, you always been a role model. I always looked up to you, Ed, Dan, and all that kind of stuff. You guys have always been personal clients of mine and, and good friends of mine. Mm-hmm. And I know that success leaves clues, man. You know what I mean? And so I know for a while, um, I had to ignore everybody, go to a quiet place, and just do my thing. So for a period of, I would say, about eight to 10 years, I disappeared. You know what I mean by disappearing is, is, is that, you know what, I stopped listening to everybody. You know, I stopped looking at what everybody else was doing. I just put my feet on the ground and hustled. You know, made it happen. Yeah, made it happen. Mm-hmm. You know, made it happen. I'm like, you know what? I just gotta, you just gotta do this. So I was in the zone, mm-hmm. you know? And then when I finally got to where I wanted to go, I'm never, we're never where we wanna go, but got to a comfortable place. Then I came out, I'm like, all right, now, now I feel comfortable to be able to sit down here with you and then and, and be able to talk to you and all that kind of stuff. Have you ever done that? Yeah, I, I would say, because my business is a little bit more different than maybe what you win, uh, the way you did it, because I've always sort of been in the public eye. Yep. Uh, we always have meetings and seminars and events where you're exposed out to the public. So I guess I was doing the same thing you're doing, but I was being watched every week and um, every month by the number of people out there. So my progression was being watched by all the people that I'm in front of. Actually, because our nature of our business is a little different. A little bit different, yeah. So tell me about your, you know, your beginning. Where were you born? Tell me, tell me about your mom. Tell me about your dad. Tell me about your beginnings. I want to know, you know the successful man in front of me. You know, how, you know, how was it from the beginning? Well, Sam, uh, the story's out there, and it's not a secret to anyone because I put it out on my Instagram and stuff, but uh, I was born really poor. 
Mm -hmm. uh, on a dirt floor in a little farm town in Zacatecas, Mexico. So all of Zacateca, you, Mexico. Yeah, okay. Isn't that, you, isn't that like where, where like the, the drug lords are and all that kind of stuff? Well, there's drug lords throughout. Yeah, okay. So we happen to have our share of them <laughs> okay, as well okay. and violence and drama and all that. But the, I was, back then it wasn't, that wasn't the case. It's mm -hmm. more of a recent thing where you hear all this violence and stuff. But I was born uh, in a very modest home, at, uh, a home made out of adobe. I don't know if you know what that is. I have no adobe idea what is that like is. A, it's like sort of like mud and like this material that's compacted together. Oh, I've seen that back 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 in Iran, where I'm from. Yeah. It's like it's like kind of. I, I know exactly what you're talking about yeah, now. Okay, so yep. A, adobe people know as like the tech company. Like like one out. little earthquake, the whole thing collapses. Well. I, I don't I don't ever remember any earthquakes over there at that time, but yeah. In other words, just Adobe. It's just it wasn't made like homes like the yeah. Because I know I know in, in you know in our country, Iran ha is very prone to earthquake, and I remember they had like a six point earthquake, and the whole town collapsed because of that kind of yeah. you know infrastructure. Okay, so I was born there. And my mom was um, there uh, in in our house, two little bedroom house, uh, not two two room house. So one side was a kitchen. And then one side was this, this is a, sort of like a living room, which also had a couple of beds in there. And my dad was out in the field working and my mom gave birth to me and my grandmother was a midwife. Now granted, it's like these are women from back then, they had no epidural. Oh yeah, they had no old hospices, school, old no school. nurses, yeah. no Lamont's classes, none yeah. of that. So just, you know, you talk, about, you talk about women that were just like tough. Hey, and man. They, they didn't know any better, so they just yeah. rough right through so it. Do, yeah. So she had me, and then about a year, <laughs> when I was about a year and a half old, um, I don't really remember this, but my mom and dad left to the United States in search of opportunity. And they left my sister and I, I have an older sister, Yolanda, and they left us with my grandmother so that she could, they could take care of us. So your sister, you said, is older? Yes. Okay, how, how old is your sister? How much older? Uh, she's about a year and a half older. Okay, yeah. so you were one and a half, your sister was three. Yes. You know, your parents left to America for a better opportunity and left you back with yes. who? With my grandmother and my aunts. Okay. And a couple of uncles too. I know, but for them, that, that would have been heartbreaking for them, you know, because yeah. you know, but they're, they're doing the right thing. They want to search for opportunity. You know, they trusted them. Okay. All right. So they came here and, you know, interesting story. Uh, my mom goes back. We just met with her not too long ago and, and she told us, retold us a story now that it's captivating. And she said, so they left Zacatecas and went to the, to the border, to Tijuana. And then from Tijuana there, there's these guys that <clears throat> sort of, they're your tour guides per se. We call them coyotes, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so they said, okay, you come over here. They took my dad to one side because he was, he was gonna go on foot and crossing mm -hmm. the border. And then they stuck my mom of a, in the trunk of a car with eight other people. And for the next two hours, they moved through the, through the border crossing. And then finally, two hours later, they opened up the trunk and they're almost ready to die because she said they're running out of oxygen. And it was just, you know, they're in there like sardines. So, so my mom was ba basically putting her life on the line in order to give her kids a shot at the big time in America. And my dad walked the desert for about two days with limited food and water. And then by the grace of God, with no telephones, all they had was, a, was an address. And like two days later, they met back in, not too far from here, about half an hour from here, maybe a little bit more, in Pasadena, California. They both got there by the grace of God. Okay, so when they got here, mm -hmm. you know, what happened after that? So they came here for an opportunity. You know, I'm sure, you know, in the beginning, they had to have all kinds of odd jobs and all, ends oh, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. So they did everything. Any, any work available, they would do. Yep. So yep. They, they weren't picking and choosing. You know, definition of doing whatever it takes. Absolutely. This is, you know, a lot of people talk about, do, oh, I'll do whatever it takes. I do it. But, but, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, they walked in the desert for two days, shrunk, almost, almost died, and without a lack of oxygen. They came in in a, in a new country, don't speak language in the mm -hmm. middle of nowhere, strange, left the kids and family at home. This is definition of do whatever it takes. Because I hate Absolutely. when people say, I'll do whatever it takes, but I have to leave the room when somebody does that. Yeah. I'm like, you don't know that what definition of all, all it takes. It's always they're willing to work conditionally. Yeah. If yeah. things have That's to be bullshit. this way. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, you and I understand that. And sort of this, one of the things that really uh, gets me excited about certain people you meet is this immigrant mentality. Yeah. Is they're willing to do whatever it takes. They're not, they're not too pretty. They're not too cute. They're not too educated. They're not too smart. They're willing to do whatever it takes. And the people who do that obviously create this significant advantage over everyone else who sets certain, certain conditions and parameters by which they're going to be successful by. So that was my mom and dad. They worked here for three years or so. And then when I was like five, they went back and got us. Do you, do you remember that? Do you remember that? I do. I do. So, yes. in the, so, so just tell me in your, you know, 
so from one and a half to five, you didn't see your, you, you didn't see your parents. Mm -hmm. What was going through your mind as a, as a little kid? You know, what, what did your aunt say? What did your grandma tell you? Where, you know, all of a sudden I wake up, mom is gone the next day. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna have some questions. I remember my mom one time, you know, she told me she was gonna go to work, but she went to Hong Kong for two weeks. She had, she had work to do, you know? And I got up the next day, my grandma, my grandma oh, she we going back. For two weeks, I was wondering where my mom was. You know what I mean? And tell me what happened, you know, you know, what, you know, what was going to your, your sister's mind, your mind, where, where's mom and dad? Yeah. Um, I don't really remember exactly at one and a half when they left, yeah. so I d really couldn't make that distinction of when they parted. <clears throat> Dude, I don't really remember that. But I was a kid, you know, you're out there playing with the chickens out in, you know, <laughs> in the farm. and <laughs> Literally. Playing, yeah, just sitting playing around. I had my marbles. I had my, you know, resortera, like my little slingshot. Yeah, exactly. And those are my toys. And you're just out, you know, you're poor. You don't know yeah, you're yeah, poor. No, yeah. It's just yeah. the way it goes. Uh, play that, that's the, life. Yeah. You play with the other kids yeah. there. And then my, I remember my sister was a little bit older, and I remember at night we would just hang out because she was like, you know, she was there with me, and I remember we would pray, and at one point it's like, well, you know, I see that other kids would have mom and dads, and like, where's mine? And they're like, my grandma was too old, and my aunts were just, it just didn't feel right. Yeah. And then she says, oh, they're gonna come, they're gonna come. So she kept the, like inspiring me that there was this hope that my parents were gonna come back and get us. And they did. And, and then the when they did, but so I was had gotten so acclimated to the environment with my uncles because they were real playful. They had a, my uncle Nino, that's what mm. we call him, and he was like he was my hero. You know, he had this big truck, and I used to jump <laughs> on the truck with him. And we all have that uncle. Man. I just had that uncle. He was just he was fun to be with, and all. And then my dad came. My dad was a little bit stricter, a little bit you know, a little bit more direct and stuff. And. So I had to go from this uncle of mine to my dad. That was all fun dad. and kind of hero. Yeah. And, like a, and then all of a sudden my dad was a little bit more strict and he was just, so I kind of didn't like that. I, would, I had needed time. He says, no, I'm your dad. And then I questioned like, no, you're not my dad because I don't know, I don't even know you. So, yeah. uh, but you know, we went through that. They brought us to the United States. The other day I had one how, of my How did functions. they bring you? Did they get the citizenship here and they brought you? Or, uh, I think or, they had, or, 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 I, you, or did you get here in the trunk of the car too? No, no, no. Thank <laughs> God for me. I mean, they, they paid the price so that I could come in just legit with Got my it. passport. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. The gym of the they had established. Uh, so you had it easy, man. Yeah, yeah. I had it easy, uh, at least in that regard. In that regard, yeah. I didn't pay the price. I didn't walk the desert, yeah. and I wasn't in, in the trunk of yeah. a car uh, trying to come over. It wasn't one of these really hard situations. So I think we took the bus from Zacatecas when we all came as a family to to uh, Tijuana, and then from there we came over and we went through immigration, and then they took a picture of us. Mm -hmm. The other day I showed that picture of all three of us. Back then you could have three kids on a pass or a visa, whatever that was, where there was a, our entrance into the official entrance into the United States. It's unbelievable. All three of them, here's these little three kids. Uh, it was my younger sister, my um, older sister, and myself. And then my brother was actually born here, so they call him the, you know, the, the Norteño. He was, he, was a, he was the one that made it. He was the one that, that had U.S. citizenship, and we obviously, I'm a U.S. citizen now. But, now, yeah. But, yeah. you know, I went through all the... So it's four of you guys combined. All four of us. Oh, okay. So how was your life... You know, now in America, now you're, you're, you know, now you come here, you're what, four and a half, five years old now? Five years old. You know, so how is your life now different? Because you come to a new country, you don't speak English, you know, you know, how was it? How was it, you know, how was the, how, how was the beginning? Well, we're, I often tell the story that we were poor in Mexico, but we're also poor here. Yeah, I mean, you didn't, yeah. You, you, yeah. And my parents had low paying jobs. We lived in a little one bedroom shack in East Pasadena, California. And I remember sleeping on the floor. Did you, did you, ever, you ever drive by there every once in a while? Oh yeah, I drive there. Whenever I'm in the area, I just drive by. Now they torn the house, the, the house down because it was a house and it was like sort of industrial and commercial buildings <laughs> around it. Mm -hmm. And there was like a now it's like a tow a tow yard right around there. Yeah. So I just go by just to like reinvigorate. Like this is where I came from, and now this is what has happened. And I just go there just and I remember the the uh, warehouse with these big trucks that were across the street, and then the neighbor to our right and. There was this, uh, this uh, major street with, uh, on San Gabriel Boulevard where my mom used to work at this pottery and she used to like with her hands, she used to like make these pots, come home all dirty and stuff. And yeah. you know, she's just paying the price to feed the family. So I go by there sometimes and I just, I even go by the house where I was actually grew up at now in a different city in Duarte. And it just blows me away. It's like, I can't believe we used to live in that house. You know, like, it's, it's just crazy. 900 square foot I know. House. I, I do the same thing. You know, Dude. every time I go, go to Pennsylvania, matter of fact, I, I did a couple of videos in front of the house that, you know, when we first came to the U.S., mm -hmm. you know, and it just, it's just such a good reminder. You just gave me an idea. I think I'm going to go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I'm it's a great, yeah. i video and right in front of the two Exactly. And talk about, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was definitely 
Definitely do that, man. You know, it just shows your history. And, you know, I'm actually contemplating on buying the homes in Pennsylvania that we lived in, you know, you know, and, and just, just as a history, you know, I, I rent it out, but it's a historic landmark. Cause I mean, Pennsylvania, the home was like, I think, you know, one of them was like 50,000, one of them was 100,000, yeah, you know what I mean? Well, I mean, just, just as, a, as, as a history, you know what I yeah. mean? You can, you can have it, you know, have it out. So, so, you know, tell me, you know, you know, you know, growing up, you guys were poor and all that kind of stuff. You know, tell me how, when you went to school, you know, you know, was there any discrimination? You know, oh, what, you know, you know, all, you know, you know, tell me about all I that. I can tell you all about that. Yeah, just obviously you're the kid there. You're the, you stand out from everyone. By the way, the, by the way you dress, you have an accent. Uh, you don't really know the language. Uh, people, you're an easy target to be picked on. Yeah. It's just, you talk yeah. about the kids that are like that and they're yeah. shy. Yeah. And your parents say, you know, you got to behave all the time and do the right thing. And so you don't know how to defend yourself. You Were you shy you, growing up? I would say, I would say a little bit. And then I think it quickly wore out to the point where it just said, this is, this doesn't work. Being shy, it's yeah. just. You, yeah, because you, I mean, I know all these years that I've known you, you're such, you have such a strong personality, such a strong presence. You know, you're such an alpha male. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, everybody who meets you, you know, they said, man, you know, when he comes in the room, you feel it. You know, I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm like, yeah, that's, that's G, yeah, yeah, that's G, you know what I mean? And, and so, so, you know, you know I, I can see that you might have been a little bit, but then you had to alpha up to be able to say, hey man, totally, this ain't gonna work for me, right? Totally true, totally true. I, I, I constantly talk about that topic of when people are shy, for example, you know, I have two kids, the two boys, I have a daughter, she's 17, just, uh, she's getting ready to go to college. And I often, we meet a lot of people in our business, mm -hmm. we meet a lot of couples, a lot of people with kids, yeah. and you see couples that have kids that are shy, and then parents that are shy. And I just feel that that's such of a, a, a quality that people need to rid themselves on. I don't know if it is a quality, I think it might actually kind of hold you back. Somehow. Oh yeah, it absolutely is, man, yeah. absolutely In is. In business, if you're shy, you'll starve. No, I mean, I mean, look, man, you, you can't be shy in anything. No. You know, you can't be shy in anything. You gotta know what you want, go after and be confident and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. There was a, there was a kid on my team that uh, was literally, you know, shy. And I think part of the reason, you know, was that her mom kept telling her as, as a kid when she was growing up, hey, he's shy, he's shy. So he believed that he was shy, Absolutely. you know, and for the parents out there, man, and don't label your kids. Yes, mind. yeah. It's it sort of Yeah, a, you can't do that. You they know? had him believe that he really was. 100%. Absolutely, yeah. So going back when I was a kid, um, you had to learn quickly learn how to defend yourself yep. and stand up for yourself. If not, you'll be picked on and bullied and talked about. And so it's a, it's a cruel world out there. And either you learn how to step up and fight it or you'll just you'll fall victim to it. Yep. And you see a lot of people that are very victim mentality. And that victim mentality starts, I believe, when they were kids because they're picked on and then they just accept that and that's just the way it goes. And then later on they grow up, they're picked on by their boss, they're picked on by society, they're picked on by creditors, by their bills. So they're, they feel like they're a victim and they don't know how to stand up for themselves and defend themselves. I couldn't agree with you more, man. There's nothing worse than being a victim mentality. Hey, we've all been a victim. Mm -hmm. We've all been a victim. You've been a victim, I've been a victim. Everybody has been a victim at some point in their life. Is what you do with it, how you stand up to it. Are you gonna Absolutely. cower down and label yourself as something? Or are you gonna stand up and fight back and be like, look, I'm not a victim anymore. I'm gonna use this to catapult, catapult myself and become better, become more confident and be able to fight back. And that's what you have done. Yes. So tell me, you know, so in high school, you know, let's talk about high school. Did you, did you work in high school? Did you do anything? I what? work, I worked throughout almost Sam as, as, as far back as I can remember. I remember I was always working, hustling, selling stuff, doing something to have money in my pocket. I love I, it. So, so, so at what age did you start working? At what age you says, you know, I, I, I just want money in my pocket. Um, I remember being in the third grade Clearly, just remember this. I remember being in the third grade and I had worked and I think I mowed someone's lawn, uh, mowed someone's lawn. I think I washed someone's car. I did something. You know, here I am seven years old, eight years old and I could work, <laughs> right? I could do something. And not just, you know, not on the tablet or just yeah, yeah. The video games or Nintendo. You're physically or, or, working. I said Nintendo and now it's... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah that, that, you're showing our age, man. Yeah, exactly. I understood that. We were right here, bro. <laughs> I think that was PlayStation or something or Xbox yeah. or whatever they have today. But I remember earning my money and I just felt proud of it. It's like I worked and I got paid and here's my money and I had that result in my hand. And then I put it in my pocket and I went to school. And then at school, I just happened to do something. I pulled out $5 in front of, you know, in front of some of the kids there. And the kids looked at me like I was like, 
wow, you have five dollars. It was like so much money. It's kind of like a kid going to school today pulls out a hundred dollar bill. I, yeah, I would imagine yeah, it's yeah. Some, some degree like that. So I had my five dollars, and I remember I was like, yeah, I got these five dollars because I did maybe what you didn't do. Because most people Gosh, are expected this is so good, to have a handout, yeah. and then I earned it. So that feeling yeah. of I earned it, because my parents were poor. They didn't really give us any money. That I, is, that I, remember, is. I never had an allowance. Uh, everything I had from, uh, I remember being in the third, fourth grade. I was already working to buy my own shoes. Because my parents you know, couldn't do it. They're just, they didn't make enough, number one. And then whatever little they did make was just to keep Your parents, afloat. I'm sorry, but that's, they did you a favor. You are the reason you are, because if they'll give you an allowance, you wouldn't have done that. You know, if they were to give you a handout, you wouldn't have done that. I, I don't think you would have been here no. if your parents were rich. You know, you, you're given a silver platter. You're swimming, you wanted, a, you know, I don't know about you, G, but ever since I was a little kid, I just wanted better things in life. You know, I wanted, I, I wanted. That makes two of us. You know what I mean? Ever since, I, I mean, ever <laughs> since I can remember. Like, you know, I remember, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, watching, you know, Magnum PI, you know, mm -hmm. I wanted a red Ferrari, you know, I watching Cannonball Run, I wanted a Lamborghini, you know, you know, you know, I, you know, I see, I wanted, I, I wanted to, you know, have the, have the good things in life. And, and I didn't know what to do, but I was willing to do whatever it took. Mm -hmm. I was willing to, if I need to work till midnight, if I don't have to sleep, if I had to get up, whatever, I was willing to do it. And like I said, I didn't have a handout, you didn't have a handout. And at the time when I was growing up, not having a dad for a second, I felt bad for myself. I don't have a dad, I don't have a dad. But have I had a dad or have I had all this thing handed to me? I don't think I would have been where I'm at. Well, they would have robbed you of your hunger. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I had one of my friends, a good friend of mine, um, Rafa Mejia, he, he, the other day we had a little conversation. He told me, he says, you know why you're successful? And I says, well, I, I guess I have a series of reasons why I'm successful. <clears throat> he says, uh, you were born with hunger. Yeah. Yeah. So I think when you, in, when you enable people, you rob them of their hunger. You rob them of the fight they're supposed to have to go this battle themselves. This is so good, man. This is so good. I mean, these are some, this is some serious nuggets you're dropping here, man. And, and, I, and I appreciate it. So, you know, I want to talk to you more about that, but just really quick, because mm -hmm. before it steps my mind, right? Okay. So, you know, you have two sons and a daughter, right? Yes, sir. You are beyond wealthy. Hmm, I don't know about you know that. What I mean, I mean, I mean, you, more. I mean, uh, uh, because you're so, we're still hungry, right? Still hungry. Still hungry. Hungrier. Right? You have everything you ever need, you know, plus more, right? How do you instill those hunger that you have to your children? I'm, I, I, I want to know because I want to do the same. I struggle with that. Yeah. How do you do that? One, I think that's a great question and I don't know that I have the I don't know that I've cracked the code for it or have the complete answer I, I, I guess time will tell right yeah but uh, but overall just the the conversation that I have with them is we have this whole thing about the other day my son uh, Valentino he's uh, he's six years old now just this beautiful soul he's like my best friend in my life he's only six years old but he's just <laughs> I love him and Valentino uh, the other day kind of complained to his mom and I. He says, well, why do you guys have to leave? He says, well, Papa have to leave to go to the office to go create more business so we can make more money so we can do this. He says, but you already have a lot of money. I guess he you know, sees me. <laughs> he says, you already have a lot of money. I says, yeah, Papa, I already have a lot of money, but you already have a lot of toys. And every time we go to the store, you want more toys, don't you? And it caught him. He says, oh. And mm. now he understands. The correlation. My, my little one also, too. He goes, imas, imas, imas. Like, do you want more and more and more? And, and you don't necessarily just want more money just so that you can buy it's, more it's, things. It's achievement. It's achievement. It's, it's the thing that if, if you stop doing that, then it robs you again of your hunger. Yeah. And as far as I'm concerned, we all got to eat every day. But I mean, I mean, you know, Guillermo, we, we, you know, I've I known you and I know your lifestyle and all that kind of stuff. You know, you're not only net worth rich. You taught me this. You're lifestyle rich. You know what I mean? It's not like, you know, you're gone all day. You don't see your family. You're with your family. You know, you, you know, you provide and all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk to you. We'll talk about more of that. You know, a lot of people are net worth rich. You know, you know, you know, I do pretty well, but I'm not as lifestyle rich as you, you know, because I, I do have a lot of businesses and I got to be in the meetings and things like that. You know I mean? I remember, you know, one time we had a meeting, you were working out in the middle of a day, you know, 24 hour fitness. I'm like, dude, this guy's working out. I'm like, Jesus Christ. I mean, you have like, you know, that's what like housewives work out. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you, know, you, 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 I mean, yeah, you, you, you de yeah. definitely have designed your life. Exactly. You know, you know, you live your life by design, not default, you Absolutely. know, and, and I really admire that about you. Well, Sam, what, what it is, is it, I think you need to find something that's going to give you the opportunity to live life on your terms. So yeah. we talk about this, this term lifestyle network uh, i'm sorry network. net worth mm -hmm. so lifestyle net worth mm -hmm. 
So a lifestyle net worth refers to the richness in your life in multiple areas. So there are people who have a lot of money, but they have no time. Yeah. And then there are people that, that, who- that, That's me right now. Okay. You know what I mean? And, well, and you taught me that. You taught me that. I remember sitting down in the car with you, we had this conversation. You know, you said, Sam, I'm not, you know, not, I'm not only net worth rich, I'm lifestyle rich. And I looked at you, I'm like, you're a dick, bro. You just, <laughs> you, 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 you just reminded me that I'm, I'm poor when it comes to lifestyle. And it made me level up. I've changed some things. You mm-hmm. just came in, you just came in right now, you know, for this podcast. And you said, hey man, how many people do you have? Mm-hmm. You know, after our conversation, I literally start delegating everything. And I was like, you know what? You know, I want to be lifestyle rich. I want to be like him. I want to work out at 10 o'clock in the morning, you know, have no care in my mind, you know, come out of 24 hour fitness and then we're like, we're going to lunch. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so I appreciate that. And, you know, I, you know, thank you for, you know, teaching me that term. Lifestyle net worth is important where, and it goes right back to that. Mm-hmm. So how, how rich are you with regards to your money? Mm-hmm. How rich are you with regards to your health? Yes. Okay. How rich are you with regards to your relationships? Yes. How rich are you with your time with your family? Yeah. Okay. It's the one percent. How, how rich are you from a spiritual standpoint? Yeah. How rich are you with regards to you being able to dictate the pace of your life yeah. and where you go and, and where you don't go? Or yeah. Just everything about your life. Yeah. It's like where you eat, how you dress, where you're seen at. Yeah. The things that you do and also the calmness you have. Do you have peace in your mind or are you a racket? Yeah. And it's so many people that are in the hustle and then they quite don't know how to channel their energy in ways where that can really suit their whole life. Oh, I've, I've been there. I've been there, you know, and, and I'm not, I don't have it perfect yet, yeah. but I'm working on it. And, 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 I, I'm and I must you. admit to you, Sam, for a period of my life, I don't know if it's five, 10 years or so, I was like all gung ho trying to build it. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, in my opinion, mm-hmm. in my opinion, there is no such a thing as balance. You know, balance is earned, not given. You That's know, the biggest myth right now in business. Yeah, you know, how do you oh, balance things? You know, you know, balance, think, you know, there we, is no balance. You know, you know, you know, you know, especially if you're starting out, right? So, you know, if you're starting out, you can't all of a sudden just be balancing everything and, and move any needle forward, right? No, no. So you got to be gun ho You got to go at, yeah. its, at, at one point, do, go all in and take care of one thing so that this way you can come back and balance everything else. If you're trying to be balanced at everything, then you're not going to build nothing. Yeah, yeah. You don't put enough gas in any one tank. Yeah, uh, you, I think you need a max out there. It's funny you mentioned that right now because <clears throat> yesterday we had this meeting. We have once a month we have a meeting called Momentum Monday. All of you guys can go right on the website. On the, you can go to my uh, on you, my YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. And I what is your YouTube uh, channel? Uh, Guillermo Haro WFG. Okay, team, uh, I believe it's Team Conquer. Okay, Team Conquer. Yeah, Team Conquer WFG Guillermo Haro, and I I throw my seminars on there every single time. All mm-hmm. my talks, everything that we talk about. And yesterday was probably one of the best ones we had in a long time. One of the gentlemen that I have in my business his name is Danny Faria. It's just an incredible human being. This guy used to change tires at Costco. I mean, go figure. He used to change tires at, at Costco. Someone invited him to one of our business functions, one of our money seminars. And this guy, of course, enters the business and, you know, wet behind the ear, doesn't know anything from anything, greasing his nails. And he, we started to mold this guy and shape him. And yesterday he got up on stage and this guy's just dressed to the T. He's got a beard trim like yours. And, <laughs> he, and, he, and he saved his money. So to his credit, he paid attention to all the things we teach him. So many people out there making money, but they're blowing it. Yeah. They got bottle service in Vegas. They got yeah. the newest cars. They got, they got a lot of jewelry. They have all these little knickknacks and stuff, and they forget about accumulating liquid cash. Yeah. Yeah. And you got so much news out there and so, many, yeah. so much noise out there about people saying, you got to have this and you got to have yeah. that. And I didn't buy into that. I bought into saving money. The, the idea of having $100,000, $200,000 saved in an account where you look at a statement, it has your name and it has a balance there. So Danny has been able to do that and I think he's coming up on about half a million dollars of money saved. You take a guy from changing tires at Costco to now coming up on and, 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 500000 saved. And, and about how long? Uh, oh, less than 10 years. That's crazy. Yeah, less than 10 years. That's crazy. And, and by the way, and... He dresses nice and he travels and he just had a baby and he married a beautiful girl and he's, he's molding his life. So therefore one day when he's as old as you and I, this guy is sitting on top of something that he's created and built for the rest of his life. How, I mean, I'm sure he's just one of hundreds of success stories hundreds. that you have hundreds. I mean, yes. I know, I know you have helped literally hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, be multimillionaires and, and live the dream and all that kind of stuff. How does that make you feel? Because, you know, you know, listen, you know, it's cool that you're successful. You know, it's cool that, you know, I do pretty well, right? 
that's really cool, you know? But after a certain point, you know, after you, you, you take care of your basic necessities, you have your home, you have a nice car, you have a beautiful family, you know, you can travel where you want, you know, mm-hmm. you don't have to balance your checkbook no more. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm sure you still do, you know, because you, I know, you, 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 I know you're very militant. You know, but, but after, after you, you, know, you do that, it comes to a point in life is like, look, what difference can I make? You know, not, not these people are your trophies, mm-hmm. right? You know, just like, you know, my franchisees, you know, when, 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 when I get a, you know, letter, hey man, you know, we used to live in a, you know, one bedroom apartment, all five of us, now we have a home. You know, I never took a vacation before. I know you get the same like that. How does that make you feel on the inside? Uh, it's just the, one of the more rewarding feelings ever. To be able to have an impact in someone's life, like, to someone, like the way mm-hmm. someone impacted me, Ed my lad brought me into the business and molded me and worked with me and developed me and just, you know, basically course corrected me yep. and shined me up. And I've been able to do that with many, many people. And it's just got to be one of the more rewarding feelings ever to say, because of my example, because of my influence, because of the work that I put in, because of the conversations we have, this person has been able to consume that information, then apply it, and now their life is changing. You just watch them, man. You just watch people just become rich in all areas of their life right before your eyes. And that is just such an incredible feeling. It's kind of like when your kid does really good in school and they bring home straight A's, or they win a ball game and they hit the game-winning hit or home run Mm -hmm. or something, or they made the game-winning bucket. When your kid achieves, how do you feel as a parent? Yeah. So in our business, it's like, these are all my kids. And now there's thousands of them. So you obviously know some kids more than others. In this case, they're grown adults that have, that have applied themselves. And then what you teach them, they actually put in motion and they, they stay consistent with it. So <clears throat> action and consistency are two of the biggest components that's, associated with success. You just read my mind, right? So you just read my mind because I was going to ask you something and I think you already answered it, but I'm going to ask it to you anyway. Sure. Just want to make sure. So I know you have thousands of agents under you you know, thousands, right? You know, and, and you know, it's kind of like, you know, I feel like when you have an organization under you, you know, I have, I, you know, we have 110 franchisees, right? You know, some franchisees excel, you know, they're the top 10. Some franchises do very good. Some franchises do okay. And some franchises just don't do crap. And, you know, you know, and they just don't do it, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I'm sure you have the same thing. Absolutely. I learned in life, there's always that bell curve. You know, there's always that bell curve. You know, there's always, no matter what, a teacher comes in, gives the same exact lesson to a group of children. Mm -hmm. Some of them will get A's, some of them will get B's. Obviously, there's going to be C's, D's, and and failures. You know, how how do you deal with that? Because, I mean, for me, I had a hard time for a while. You know, I'm like, look, man, look at this guy. You guys started at the same time. This guy went, and when I talked to him, he went and became a multi-millionaire. He's doing it, and you didn't do shit with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that, 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 used to, that, that used to bother me. Does that bother you still? Or, or how do you deal with that? Or how can you change that around? Or how can you change this person, I guess, yeah, if the there's, reality there's possible? Is, the reality is, Sam, I've learned with people, because I'm in the people business. Yeah. You are too. Uh, people are people are people. Uh, characteristics that are ingrained <clears throat> in the very fiber of who they are will, will remain who they are no matter what. You have people in, in any business, uh, you always have your 80 percenters yep. and your 20 percenters. Yep. And then from that 20 percenters, you have your one percenters, you yep. know, to credit yep. to, your, to your brand. Um, the, here's one thing that we say uh, in our business, we have the same company. We have the same market. We have the same license. You have the same system. You have the same opportunity, but we don't have the same belief. We don't have the same work ethic. We don't have the same plan of attack. So good. We don't have the same discipline. So good. So these are things that separate. Like the separation oftentimes is you could have the same opportunity, but you have separate, you have different belief systems. You have uh, just different ambitions. Some people will do it and then some people won't. Okay. So I got a question for you. Mm -hmm. So all these years you've been doing this, I put 10 people in front of you right now and they all want to be your agent. And they all say they want it, hmm. right? You got them? They all say they want it bad, okay. right? Okay. Can you identify the winner right away? Or, 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 is, or, or is it just something time will tell? Because let me tell you something. I thought I could. Identify that immediately? I, I, yeah, immediately. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, like you, like, oh, this guy's gonna be a superstar. You know, this guy, you know, this guy will, will, will definitely be a one percenter, that, that, you know, the 20 percenter or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You know, I thought I could, you know, but 
I, after a while, I gave up. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know what? I, because, you know, you know, you know, I have so many people, you know, come to me. You know, this is about the weight loss, right? I had people come crying to my office. Sam, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, I'm tired, I'm, I'm, I'm overweight, I gotta do this, I tried everything. This is the time, I wanna do it, I'm crying. You see their emotions, they're, they're you know, and then they're ready to sign up, I spent all this time with them. Next day or next day, they don't show up and they have mm -hmm. all these excuses yeah. and all that, self-sabotage and all that kind of stuff. So I've learned, man, the only way is, it's almost a numbers game. You know, cream will always rise to the top, you know, get as many people and let them know what, you know, whoever wants it, they're gonna excel and, and those are the ones I'm gonna really pay attention to because that's who, that's who they're real. Because you really can't, you know, you, know, you know, one of my friends said that you can't, you know, feed a mouth if it's not open. You know, can you, can, but, but have you developed that skill? Because I haven't. Well, everything you said is true, and then there's a, there's a few more points on top of that, I would say. The important thing to understand is that, you, number one, you're looking for hunger. Like, who really does hang, hung, ha, has hunger and then is willing to show up with it? So showing up, yeah. Yeah. opposite of some people says, it's just <laughs> if you show up, it's not good enough. No, because there's people who don't show up. So if you show up, that says that, okay, work with me. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day is watch them. Because a bunch of people have a good game. They talk a good game. They say the right things. They dress nice. They're sharp. They're educated. But at the end of the day, is, are they willing to get in the game and stay in the game? Are they willing to do the hard work, the nitty gritty? Are they willing to really show up and, and make that happen? And you really learn that over the course of time. Yeah. Give me three months with someone, and I can. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you exactly. what Because you see happen. patterns, right? Yeah, you see patterns and consistency well, and all that kind of stuff. That's because you know, you know, Tony Ramos always talks about you know, if you see the pattern, right? Absolutely. You know, and and and, and uh, well, yeah. you see the willingness to change, the willingness to learn. They make eye contact. You can tell that they're <laughs> gobbling it up as you speak it. You can just tell that they're that they're consuming the information and they're quickly applying it. And then one of the things that I've learned big time with successful people is they keep their word. Yeah. That's one of the things that I've learned as a man, from my dad to my grandfather to these other men, is like whenever you say something, that's a very big Mexican thing I would say, you know, honor your word. Yeah. Uh, your word is as good as you are. Yeah. That's, if your word is not good, then what is good? So simple, but yet these days it's almost like, you know. It's, yeah, because you got, you got the flaky society today. You got people that say one thing, they do another. They don't commit to that. So I pride myself as if I say I'm going to do something, like Sam, I told you I'd be here at 10 yeah. o'clock in the morning, and I'm here. Oh, you know, it's, it's like, you know, John, John said, I'm going to confirm. I said, we don't have to confirm. I know we will be here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, he's, he's like, he's, yes. <laughs> and for, that doesn't necessarily apply to everybody because people are quick to say something came up. If you're the kind of person that always is talking about something came up, that means you have your stock is yeah. low and, and gonna crash. And then also the fact that you have to be reminding them, you gotta keep confirming, hey, um, it, there's no value in saying something and then not following through with it, zero. Yeah. So I think that's a very compromising position people put themselves in. They say one thing, they don't follow through with it. They don't, people can't count on you. Yeah. The stock with me is, hey, if G said he's going to do something, he's going to do it. He's going to come through. I'm going to come through. I mean, barring a few massive emergencies or something, which almost never happened. Yeah. But overall, whenever I say something, I'm going to do it. Yeah, and, and I think as you should, as everyone should. Absolutely. You know? All right, so at three years old, you, 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 know, you know, I mean, I mean at, at third grade, you, you, know, you start selling stuff and all that kind of stuff. All right? You know, tell me in high school, what did you, what did you do in high school? Working throughout my high school years, mm -hmm. playing sports. So it's funny how I went to school, I still had a job, and I was still on the sports teams. I love sports. Yep. I love basketball, football, baseball. Uh, Try to do a little running, uh, run track. Um, I never really played <clears throat> soccer. I mean, you would think I'm Mexican, I would play <laughs> soccer, but somehow never caught on to that. But basketball really caught my attention. Mm -hmm. So I find a way to maneuver my schedule so therefore I can go to school. Pretty average mm -hmm. C student, that's mm -hmm. basically who I was. I wasn't the A student, I wasn't the I didn't fail, but I wasn't the yeah. best student. So C student, I played basketball, I had a job, I paid for basically for my expenses, I saved up to buy my own car. I was in 11th grade, I bought my own car. I remember it was $3,500 I had saved for my job. That's a lot and, of money back then, man. Yeah, what would you buy? Uh, Volkswagen Jetta. Oh my God, my first car was a Volkswagen Rabbit. Okay, you know well, so, yeah, we, okay. <laughs> mine was a four-door Volkswagen yeah. Jetta, and by the way, I just, I, now I had transportation, now I was mobile, now I could do the things that I needed to do, so I moved around, and then I was just looking to, somehow, uh, looking for every way to make money. 
to make money. I just always had that inside me. I love to have money. I remember I was in, when we were in Pasadena and I, um, I had won a drawing contest at school. They took us to some museum and I won a drawing contest. And then that contest it was attached with like two or $300 prize. And they sent my mom a check to the house and I had made more money on that contest than my mom made all month at her job. That's and then she took me to the bank right there in a progressive um, savings back then, the savings mm-hmm. alone, that don't exist anymore. But she took me to that bank and, and opened up a savings account. And the lady says, wow, young man, this is a lot of money. And I'm like, man, this is like, I just, I don't know. That, that yeah, motivated you. That, at that, gave, at me, that, that yeah. gave me that spark. And I said, okay, this is the name of the game. You got you to gotta start revving up a, a net worth. <laughs> yeah. So, so, that, so that was high school. You know, um, did, you, did you ever make it to college? I made it to college for a little bit. Okay, so, so, so did you go to college because your parents said to go to college or did something you wanted to do? I or? went to college because society told me to go to yes, college. Yes, that's right. Okay, good. Because I mean, yeah. I went to college because my mom said you had to go to college, yeah. right? You know, you know, looking back <clears throat> right now, you know, looking at what you know now, you know, you know um, would you have gone to college? Under the right conditions, yes. If I had to rewrite my life all over again, no. Do you, with your kids, do you want them to go to college? Yeah. Do you want them to go to college? Yeah. To, to, to Let me tell you why. Let me okay. interrupt you for a second. Let me structure. Tell you why. Well, uh, they're going to have enough structure by having me in their life. Yeah, true that. So that's, daddy's going to provide that, yeah. the structure and the discipline and the schedules and goals and writing would you, them down. Would you say your style of, you know, uh, you know, your style of parenthood is the same as your father, or was your father a little harder, or, or how would you compare? Because you said your father was kind of hard on you yeah, a little bit. Yeah, certainly my dad was a lot harder without reasoning. He, he, wasn't, he was really old school. Yeah. It's kind of, he did uh, probably a shade lighter with maybe, maybe than what my grandfather did with him. Got it. He was just really strict, yeah. really. Yeah. That's all they know. Yeah, that's all he knew. So I don't, you know, yeah. I, I just take it, uh, yeah. some people, like my sister, kind of took it really hard the yeah. way the parenting style that my parents had with, especially my dad with her. And I just sort of took it like, hey, that's, that's how he is. So I just sort of rose above it and understood that that's the way he knew yeah. it. And my dad wasn't a very affectionate kind of person today. It's like, I just, I, I, I'm so affectionate. I'm, I hug and kiss my kids. And, 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 and your dad's still around? No, my dad was gone at, uh, he was 48 years old, he was gone. Oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry to hear uh, that. I was, it was, I was, uh, I was 19 years old or so when he was gone. So I haven't had a dad now for like, you know, almost like 30 years or so. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, so it was just, it is what it is. He was a little negligent with his health. He drank a lot, uh, didn't, didn't take, he didn't have lifestyle net worth. Uh, yeah. He was just, his whole <laughs> thing, he, he was an alcoholic. And unfortunately, he, I mean, that, that, that was that, that was, you know, you know, to get rid of his pain. You know, yeah, he was really hard working and alcoholic, wasn't the best dad, wasn't the best husband, um, could really work in those areas and then just really stuck on his ways and wasn't he developed maybe a little bit too late. Yeah, that's kind of the, yeah. that's kind of the challenge. And he probably kind of recognized it. And then, you know, a good man upstairs took him from us. Yeah. But now I look at I, I go back and I analyze my life in many ways. What did he do? And then what have I changed? Is this from one generation, Sam? Yeah. I want you to hear me on this. From one generation to the next, there's been an, an absolute 180 difference in the way we do parenting, the way we look at life, the, the values, the quality of time, and then also the reward and punishment system that I've created for our family. And not necessarily punishment, but just to to hold back until consequences. You actually, absolutely. You know I mean, yeah, you know, so. I, you know, and, and that's crazy in one generation, you know, how, how much we have changed and, and, you know, all the credit goes to you. I mean, I mean, you know, you know, tap your, you know, t- you know, tap yourself in the back, bro. I mean, you earned it. I mean, I mean, I mean, this, this happens over 10 generations, you know, you've done it over one generation, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, and it's, 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 it's just amazing seeing you, you know, against all odds. Against all odds, you, you rose above. It's funny you say that because that, we just had a conversation not too long ago with some of my business partners is against the odds. Yeah. So all of you out there listening is if you feel the chips are stacked against you, the odds are stacked against you, you could clearly still do it. I mean, you need to have massive desire. You need to go in with everything you got. You need to stay after. You need to be consistent. You need to grow. You need to cut out all the vices that slow you down. But you know, like, I don't know if you ever um, read Tim Grover's book, Relentless. Absolutely. You know, um, you know, he talks about the dark side. You know what I mean? He talks about dark side. Yes. And, and you know, for Very a while- Very familiar with that, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know you had him speak and, you know, and all that. Yes. You know, and, you know, and for, for a long time, I thought, you know, you know, I thought there was something wrong with me. You know, you know, whenever, you know, you know, there's two books that I, that I read 
that I'm like, wow, wait, wait a second, maybe I'm okay. You know, one was, you know, you know relentless. You know, you know, talk about dark side, because my dark side was always not having a father and having a chip on my shoulder and being poor and being on food stamps and, you know, having to, you know, you know, you know push the car and, 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 you know, so we can go to school because I can pop it in the clutch and get it started up and, be, you know, being picked on and, you know, and, you know, and, and, and getting cut from the basketball team and getting beat up and bullied and all that kind of stuff, mm. you know. Um, so I always had that dark side, I had that chip on my shoulder, you know, like, look, man, I'm, I'm going to show you guys, I'm going to show you what's up. You know, and, and you have, you know, yeah, and, and you know, to and then, credit. yeah, you know, and and so when 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 the, the odds were all against me, you know, I've always been the underdog. Mm -hmm. I'm used to being the underdog. I was never the one that is like, oh yeah, this guy, you know, has it all. He's gonna make you go. No, I was on. I'm used to. I, I I used to. I'm I'm used to it. And I think you have the same kind of mentality. You know, and, you know, I have a I have a feeling when somebody says, well, I don't think he can do it. You're gonna you're gonna you're not you're gonna use that as fuel, not oh, as oh my God, God, I want to be down. That's probably been one of my biggest driving mm -hmm. forces. Yeah. I've had you know some people pretty close to me. Yeah. Um, I had a conversation one time with someone really close to me that says, well, you know, you can't make it unless you have a college degree. <laughs> Sam, I looked at him right in there, I was like, and I nodded my head up and down a little bit, and I says, we'll see about that. Yeah. And then I had, I had a purpose. He said, in life, you need, you, need a, you need a hero. You need a cheerleader, right? You need a supporter. You need a coach. You need an enemy. So true. If you don't have that enemy, if you don't have that so true. one force you're trying to defeat, whether that enemy could be a belief, that enemy could, could be a person saying something bad true. about you. It could be a critic. It could be a hater. It could be whoever they are. But you need that enemy. I think for almost everybody out there, you look at successful people in politics. Do they have an enemy? Oh, successful of people in sports. Do they have an enemy? Successful people in any business owners. Do they have a competitor? Yes. So you got to understand that that person's there and they're trying to eat your lunch. So so you know, I'm glad you brought that up. You know what I mean? Because you know, you know, in the mornings, you know, when I get up, mm -hmm. you know, my routine is I come downstairs. You know, while I'm, you know, you know, mixing my pre-workout, you know, I'm reading my goals. I'm reading a list of, um, you know, things that I'm grateful for. But I also have a secret list. People that I want to prove wrong. Mm. You know, people that said, you know, I wouldn't be able to do it. People who doubt on me, who, people who put me down. You know, I have that list. You know, I call it a dark list. And I don't really share it with people. You know, um, you know, but I do have that. You know, but that, and, that, and that drives me. You know, gratitude is cool. Of course, my, my children drives me, but I need that in my life. I, 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 need, I need to have, you know, you know, I need, you know, if I'm a bad man, I need to have the joker. You know, I, you know, I need to have that. So, you know, with you, you know, having the, the, you, know, the, the you, know, you know, obviously we know who the cheerleader is. You know, you know what I mean? You know, who, you know, the coach, what would you say, Ed Mala? Was, 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 Ed Mala is uh, Ed Mala, the, certainly one of my coaches. There's mm -hmm. another a gentleman named Rich Stolle. He's one of my coaches. I have several coaches yeah. that I look up to, some from a distance. Yes. In many ways, you're sort of a coach to me. I appreciate that. So. That's, that's, that's an honor to even be, be mentioned in that, in that room, you know? Yeah. Well, and to your credit, you've done so many things that actually inspire people moving forward with their life against the odds. Yeah. So, so yeah, you have these cheerleaders, you have a mentor, you have a, you have a coach. Mentors and coaches are different. I yeah. used to think they were the same person. I've, I've recently discovered that they're really kind of different. How, how, tell me the difference. Um, I think a coach is um, very similar like what you see in sports is they're gonna guide you in that specific moment about that topic. So, so, so it's more related to, is, is, is more technical, you know, you know, it's more technical and, 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 and a mentor is more tactical. Yeah, mentor is sort of a bird's eye view. They're looking at the whole thing. Yeah. Like, if I'll mentor you, Sam, I'm gonna mentor you about your lifestyle, okay? Tell me about your marriage. Tell me about your kids. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the strategies you have for business. Tell, tell me about your financial net worth. So I'm mentoring you as sort of as a full circle versus a coach is specific maybe, to one thing. Yeah, exactly. Maybe a coach is specific to like none of my high school coaches ever talked to me about finances. <clears throat> yeah. You feel me? Yeah. Versus a mentor is sort of a, a well-rounded look at the whole thing. Let's look at the whole pie, not just one slice. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be the difference. So okay, that that that's that's profound. I never looked at it that way, mm -hmm. but that's so that, that you you just I'm I'm learning. You know this. I mean, this, I'm going to transcribe this and put it on the website because there's so <laughs> many nuggets here, man. I mean, people should just like download it, copy and paste it, and just read this over and over again and listen to it. Um, when when did you first get involved in you know the business the WFC? This was 1999, and okay. I got started. I got invited to a meeting. 
Okay. And that night I went over to, not too far from here, uh, 18780 Amar Road. I still remember the address. As a matter of <laughs> fact, I, pat, I went on an appointment. Is that in Diamond Bar? Uh, it's in Walnut. Walnut? Yeah. So I passed by there and I almost wanted the guy to stop and take a, a picture with uh, there, like at, with the address and said, this was the beginning of my business. You should do a video. I'm, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Now you just, you just lit the fire for that. So I went there in 1999. There was a guy who invited me to this money seminar, this business function. Who was the guy? His name is Jimmy Reyes. Jimmy Reyes. Okay. Jimmy Reyes. Jimmy um, Reyes. Anyway, we'll get, we'll get over that. Okay. Um, but he served his purpose. He introduced me to Ed Milet. Okay. That night, I shook hands with Ed Milet for the first time. And, and then the rest is history. So, rest he, is history. so, you know, Ed Milet told you about the business, mentored you, coached you, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And mm. He trained me. Okay. He taught me the basics of the, of the business. He um, encouraged me. He lifted me up. He pushed me. And those are, there's so much that this coach, he, so Ed Milet was sort of a figure in both areas because I was watching his life. I was watching <clears throat> the unfolding of his life yeah. and how he was already married, but I saw his wife and then he started having kids and then he... He started really increasing his net worth, and I was right there witnessing this right before my eyes, and then I would have interaction with him. And just to be close to someone that's this power with proximity concept mm -hmm. is absolutely amazing. So, so now you got me curious, man. Tell me about Jimmy Ray's. No, no, you know, you know, you know, yeah. it, it sounds like it, it, wait, you, 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 you don't like this, and I know it's probably a difficult conversation, but fuck it, let's do it. <laughs> All right, you insist. He's a gentleman that introduced me to the business, and then he was there a little bit after I got started. <laughs> And then he quit. He just exited the business for whatever the reason. Yeah. And I proceeded with the business. And we go back and in our business, like in any business, like whoever introduces you, they would have a financial incentive, a financial gain based on everything you do. Okay. So, even, even if they quit the business? No. Okay. You gotta be in it to yeah, win that's it. That's what I'm saying, right? Yeah, you gotta be at the winner. So right. he, he, didn't, he didn't continue with the business. Who did from he a, F up? That's kind of the hard part to have is right. just, there's just so much. And, you know, people, I, I, from what I hear, because I mentioned his names from stage and all my stories and things once in a while, and it got back to him or something. I haven't seen him. You know, I wish mm -hmm. him well. I, he's a good man and yeah. all that. But, you know, decisions. You yeah. can make one decision from a business standpoint that could forever have a incredible uh, loss. Yeah, that was, that was a, a big mistake. You know, these my these, God, uh, you, you, be, you, be, you, you are one of the top dogs in that business. And he would have just laid back and just, oh, my God. Oh, yeah. my God. So there's something to learn about. Hey, hang in there. Stay strong. <clears throat> Don't quit. I'm not a quitter. You know, I often hear things throughout social media. You know, winners never quit. Quitters never win. Well, really believe <laughs> that and then live by it. And today we have people that get started as entrepreneurs and then they find out it is a challenge. You know, being an entrepreneur, a successful one is not easy. Well, I mean, look, man, everybody wants immediate gratification. You know, they want to put in the least amount of work and get the maximum amount of return. And life just doesn't work that way. Absolutely you know, we, know we, all, we all know about the 10,000 hour rule, right? Absolutely. For you to become an expert in anything, you need to put in 10,000 hours. A doctor gets a PhD, 10,000 hours. A pilot needs to put 10,000 hours, you know, to, be, to become proficient at flying a plane, you know? And you put in your 10,000 hours and plus. You know, the problem is people want to put a 500 hours here, 1,000 hours here. Oh, shit, didn't work, I'm gonna quit. No. You know what I mean? I mean, I've, you know, I've been in this business all my life. I'm in, in the fitness business all my life. And man, there's so many people who have come and gone. When the, when the things were good, they were in. When the things got a little bit sideways, this and that, or they were the yeah. first one to jump off the boat. I just stung in, hung in there because it's what my passion is, what I love, and that's where I am, where I'm at, because I put in, I put in time. That's, that's why you are where you're at, because you put in the time. And everyone who's really gotten really successful, from athletics to politics to <clears throat> business to show business to anything, any entertainer out there, uh, Sam, they put in the work, they put in the time, the dedication, they study their craft, they're, they're meticulous with their preparation. And so few people are willing to do that because it takes work. Success is discipline. not a microwave proposition. Yeah, yeah. it's discipline, it's consistency, like you Absolutely. said. It's, it's showing up when you don't feel like showing up. Yep. You know, and, and, and you've done that. So you started that business in 1999. Mm -hmm. around, around that time, who else started with you? Oh, a host of other people. Um, Dan had started a little bit before me, and I can give you, I don't know, a list of probably 50 to 100 people who also started, of which with time, they just sort of, sort of fell off. Okay, got it. So, so at, the, at, the, at the time that you started, I'm, I'm, this is just my, I just wanna see your mindset. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm fascinated. You know, I'm fascinated because I, 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 I love human performance. 
I want to I want to see what, what makes people tick. I want to see why people some people win, some people lose. I want to see why some people get ahead and then others. So I'm for my for my own thing. I'm I'm, I'm looking at this and say you just started. You went to that meeting, you know, and I bet you that was like you know probably like you know very beginning of WFG. Mm-hmm. You know you know I don't know when it was founded, but it was probably in the earlier years, right? And so many people who started maybe around the same time as you, you know. How did you rise above? You know, well, how did you how did you rise above and you know and 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 and, and are you know are are one of the top dogs? I the way I did it is I paid attention. I showed up. You showed up. I did what they asked me to do, and then I kept doing it, and then I kept doing it, and then I didn't quit, and I continued to get better and better, and I just. I saw that there was, there was a mountain of wealth ahead to go get. You saw the opportunity. I saw it. You saw I the saw opportunity, just, just like you saw the opportunity when you were third grade. Absolutely. You know, when you just had the opportunity in third grade, you saw that opportunity, you saw that you whipped out that $5. You know, you saw that now you saw that opportunity, like, man, I'm going for it. As you saw opening, oh man, I'm gonna go for this. And then uh, you just ran it. Just it just made sense to me. It says, there's a product that is being offered by this company that everybody needs. In my opinion, I believe everybody should have coverage. You know, if you have anything of value, you protect it. And, 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 and that's so huge. You're selling something that you 100% wholeheartedly believe. Without you know, a doubt. You, can't, you wouldn't be successful the way you are if you didn't believe in the product. Absolutely. You know, you can't you can, you know, you know, sell a Chevy if you believe in Ford. <laughs> right? So this is something that you have, something that you got for your kids or your family and everybody else like that. This is a product you believe wholeheartedly that everybody should have. So it's an easy, it's an easy sell. Yeah. And if it's an easy sell, then you have to put it in front of a lot of people. It's yeah. like how many, how many face-to-face conversations are you having with people about your product? Mm-hmm. I mean, you got to promote it, and you got to promote it, and you got to stay after it, and you have to continue to move forward even when things go bad. Uh, the reality is it makes sense, but not everybody thinks it makes sense. Okay. So we just you got to continue to do it, and then you got to get other people to believe it like you, and you got to get other people to believe it like you. So it's this sort of evangelical approach to it, where we're distributing this faith, and then some people catch on to that faith, and some people don't really buy into yeah. it. So yeah. I just kept doing what others didn't. Yeah, you you showed up. You were consistent. Stayed you know, the course. Yeah, you stayed the course. Stayed the course. You know, obviously that required a lot of discipline, a lot yes. of dedication, a lot of paying attention, all that kind of stuff. So this whole career started in 1999. Did at any time, did you ever say, you know what, man, this might not be it, or you know, or did at any time you had anything rocky and say, you know what, I'm gonna like the one, I'm gonna quit, and, or that was never an option. Uh, it, it was sort of an, never an option, but there's always these little vague thoughts once in a while, like maybe something else might be better. And then you start to really, you know, I'm a big believer in drawing a Franklin T. You, know, you have a question Pros about cons, something, yeah. you draw a line in the middle of the paper and this is the left side. These are all the, all the reasons why you shouldn't and these are all the reasons why you should. And then again, I just resold myself, reconvinced myself. And then you start to really look at comparisons. And it says we shouldn't compare, but the reality is we do. Yeah. We do compare, and you compare our model, our system, our business versus other opportunities out there, and hands down, Sam, I'm a pretty smart guy. Yeah. Um, I'm a pretty big common sense guy, yeah. and I can identify what is and what isn't. And, and obviously I read, I, uh, I'm, I'm financially astute, I understand what's happening, I connect with a lot of people that are really high up in, finance, in finances, and it just kept pointing to this one. Okay. And this is it. This is a this is a product that makes sense. This is a market that has been underserved for decades, and I just believed in it more and more. And I just as I was doing well, I'm one of the few people as from what I've seen. When people do well, they sort of sit back and think they've made it that they relax. One of the things that happened with me when I started to do well, I actually stepped on the gas even more. I just I, I accelerated you got, you my got efforts. More. Yes, yes. I was you, like I got hungrier. Success made me hungrier. Success didn't make, didn't make me complacent. Yes. So it's a real unique thing. Very few people have that. Uh, from what I've seen, success for many people is their own failure. The one hundred percent. It's kind of like it's kind of like the boxer who is very hungry, winning. You know the the title. And once they win the title, they start smoking their own exhaust and thinking they're all that. And then they, they train a little less and they don't, you know, they show up a little late. They buy a bunch of nice things and then they're partying. And next thing you know, they're getting knocked out. Absolutely. You know what I mean? It's the same thing, man. Absolutely. It's the same thing. You know, yes. not, you know, you're like the Floyd Mayweather. You know, you know, you're like, you know what? You know, I'm one and oh, I don't want to be one and one. I want to be two. So you kept building on that and building on that. And then mm-hmm. you stay true to the craft. You know, one of the things that, that I noticed, man, is 
is that, you know, you are very successful. You know, I have to give some of that, you know, some of that credit to your wife. No you know, doubt. you know what I mean? You know, and, and I mean, your wife is a beast. You know, I mean, you know, in the business, in the gym, as a mom, you know, I mean, she's a beast. I mean, like, like she's just an all around, just an amazing person, you know, around, very humble, you know, you know, beautiful, you know, amazing body. Like I said, she's a beast in, in, in business, you know. You notice all that, huh? I, <laughs> who doesn't? Who doesn't? You know? So, so, you know, for me, for me is, for me is like a lot of times, you know, you know, I, I was talking to Sean Ray, one of the Hall of Fame bodybuilders of all time last week. And he said that when he was competing, and I remember, because I remember seeing him in the gym, we were friends, when he was competing for Mr. Olympia for all those years, for 10, 11 years that he was competing for the, the title, he said he never had a girlfriend because he knew that, you know, he, that would be a distraction. Mm. You know, he knew that when he went to the, you know, he went to this apartment, you know, he knew exactly what the food was, exactly what, he didn't open up a, the fridge and there was cocoa puffs in there. You know what I mean? He, 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 he didn't want any distractions. And I know that's a lot of discipline, you know, for you to stay true to, to that and then just stay focused on everything. No, I don't want, I don't want any distractions, you know, but you, you know, found Angelica, you know, you guys met and all that kind of stuff. And I knew that, you know, you wouldn't pick somebody because you know your business is, you work so hard for you. Wanna, you wouldn't pick somebody who will slow you down. You would pick somebody who would compliment that. Where a lot of people, that's their biggest downfall. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, you, know, you know, they meet somebody, you know, they have a spouse and the spouse is always, you know, they're, they're not in their business, they don't understand, they want them home, you know, and you know, you really found the cheerleader that's out there pushing you. You know, tell me, tell me how you met her, how was the decision making process and, and gosh, man, you know, there's, I mean, it's refreshing to know there are women out there like that, you know what I mean? Because we, th that's, a, that's a rare breed. You found a rare breed. Oh, man. I did. Uh, let me, before we go there, let me tell you basically how that came. This was, uh, this was that week between Christmas and New Year's. I was up at my lake house in uh, Lake Arrowhead. Beautiful site there. It was all white, and the water was there on the lake. So I went out to my deck, it was high above, it was just one of the most gorgeous scenes out there. I bought that house from Ed Milet, by the way. <laughs> so I'm there outside of my lake house there, the snow, and then I <clears throat> took a pen and paper and I started just jot down my life goals and, and then I made a decision that um, I wanted to basically order, like say, God, let me place my order for a spouse. Mm -hmm. And then I started to write down all, all the, the things I wanted in a spouse. I wanted to be this, this, and this, and this. You know, who else has said that? Somebody else has said that. And it, it's almost like a genie came true, but go ahead. Oh, it's exactly. It's like I was, you know, yeah. well, I don't necessarily believe in a genie as much yeah. as a man upstairs, but yes. you get the point, though. Yes. So I was writing down the very things I wanted. And I just, I thought about it, and it was just the, the <clears> setting was beautiful. And then three months later, we're at Los Angeles Convention Center for the company convention. And I was one of the speakers, and I'm there speaking in front of, I don't know, 17,000, 18,000 people. And in the audience was Angelica and her th two other sisters. So, that, and by the way, I didn't know her. She didn't know me, but she had heard of me through, obviously, you know, I'm the, the, the one Latino in the company that's <laughs> excelled to the highest levels. I was the first million dollar earner in the company. So her group over there had talked about uh, mobilizing all the people to convention because I was going to speak, so they're going to hear my story all over again. I went up there and I told my story. I told them where I came from, my parents, very similar story that, that I gave you right now. So she was uh, in the audience and she said that my story just absolutely impacted her, captivated her. They were crying. You know, her story is a little similar to mm -hmm. mine in that regard with uh, parents that are, you know, obviously struggled and, you know, dealt with poverty and discrimination and all the challenges from transitioning from one country to another. So at that point, the company made an announcement that they, if they would make a donation to the charity that the company has, that they'd be able to bring the donation up and then shake the hands of the leaders up on stage. So I'm one of the leaders up on stage, so then droves of people line up to come give a donation. It could be a few bucks, five bucks, yeah. 20 bucks, whatever it is. So I noticed I was up on stage and then people were putting money into these wheelbarrows. But I noticed on the right side of the stage, there were two wheelbarrows and on this side where I was at, there was no wheelbarrow. So I said, well, that didn't make any sense. So then I went over there and I picked up a wheelbarrow, like, you know, like a farmer. <laughs> and I bring this wheelbarrow, like, you know, across stage. I don't know if it's, you know, 40 feet or whatever. And I bring it over to the other side of the stage 
And I put it there and people kept coming up and then they put their donation in the wheelbarrow. This wheelbarrow is getting filled with cash and we shake hands. And then one sister came up, I shook her hand and then, and then another sister and then Angelica came up and I, Angelica, she was stunning, right? I, I saw her and I shook her hand and I'm like, I looked her up and down. I just, <laughs> just, I don't know, I was just being too yeah, honest. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I looked her up you're and down. Like, what's your name? And she perks up a little bit, you know, gets the right posture and everything. She goes, Angelica. And I'm like, where are you from? She said, San Jose. And I'm like, San Jose, what team are you on? So she told me the name of the, the, name of the guy on the team. And her and I were sort of kind of rivals. And I'm like, okay, give me your name again. She said, Angelica, what's your last name? Betancourt. So I quickly got the name and I reached out to my people at home office. I says, hey, I need, um, I need the information on this person because there's some arrangements I need to make with her. <laughs> and uh, I says, well, you know, we kind of, I said, just give it to me, cut it out. So I had her number and 15 minutes later. And the follow-up system started to go down. <laughs> you, you started cold calling her. <laughs> well, she knew who I was. She yeah, knew who yeah, I was. Yeah. And so I called her up. And then um, she had a boyfriend at the time. Uh, she was really successful in uh, mortgages. Mm -hmm. she, uh, she had this boyfriend that was living with her, but obviously clearly wasn't the right fit. So during the next seven, eight, nine months, I had actually coached her on how to shake him. I said, oh, I want you to tell him this. This is what he's going to tell you. So very strategic. I put in place for her a script, if you will, of everything that was going to happen. And then we just kind of kept working through it. And then another month went by and another month went by. And then at one point I says, listen, um, you clearly know that you should be with me. And you're sort of refusing to follow this, this challenge I'm giving you to, to get rid of this guy. Because this guy's no good for you. I'm the guy. You know, drop that zero and get with this zero. <laughs> get zero, <right? laughs> And I says, I'm going to give you one more shot to do this. You must perform or else let's just between you and I, let's just cut it off. Mm -hmm. And then the following morning, I called her after she was supposed to do it. And I says, okay, and she picks up the phone. She goes, hello. I says, OK, tell me what happens. And then she paused for like 10 seconds. The minute she paused for like 10 seconds, I'm, inside of me, I'm like, yes, I you got this. You knew it. I knew it. I knew mm -hmm. it. And I says, OK, we'll quickly make this an exit. And then she was concerned about, you know, where was he going to go? Poor thing, you know, because she had he had been with her like for six, seven years. Mind, it was her house. She had yeah. bought it in her yeah, name. Yeah, she, yeah he was. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah, so she this was guy was just basically, you know, going for the ride. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, loved all the good life, but wasn't willing to, you know, own up Pretty to it. Yeah. And by the way, he didn't ask her. He didn't ask her. I mean, I had like a look in the way she looks. Yeah. This guy, Dodo Head, didn't yeah. ask her to marry her. Yeah. Um, so. Seven years? Gosh. Yeah, that's just ridiculous. So anyway, that happened. And then she, he finally got out of there. And uh, then, she, then I convinced her to move from Northern California, when they're, uh, from where they're at, uh, San Jose area, move over to Southern California. And we started our life over here. And that was a big, that was a big uh, disconnect because she's so tight with her sisters. I mean, it's like these, yeah. you've never seen sisters that are closer than these ones. Like yeah. they hug for like 15 seconds straight, maybe even longer. Constant. And they got this little ee, ee, ee. <laughs> <laughs> So it's fascinating how I married into a woman that has great family values, super hardworking. She's sharp. She's beautiful. So how, how, was she able to transition and now be part of your, obviously part of your business? Is that possible? Yeah. You know, so yeah. is that possible? It, you know? It's not easy, but it's doable. Got it. Like Got a fit body is not yeah. easy, but it's doable. Got it, man. So you, so you had some, some things to overcome to, oh, make, no to make that happen. No doubt. No doubt. But I was so determined. I, I just knew it. Well, had, I know, well, I know based on everything you've done, man, you get what you want all the time, right? Uh, well, just thank you. I was uh, committed to it. I, I just knew that that was it. And then we actually dated before she moved out here just to make sure that the chemistry was right mm -hmm. and that we connected. That we, But, you know, we're on the same page. Uh, two people aiming at the same goal. Yes. Is an unbeatable, yes. unstoppable combination. Absolutely. Now you throw love in there. Yeah. So you got two people this is, in love. This is gasoline on top of that. Aiming at the same goal yeah. is an unbeatable, unstoppable combination. That's what my wife and I have been able to do. Now let me also be honest with you. It's not perfect. I mean, you know? I mean, I mean, you're two different people. We're gonna have disagreements We're, and all yeah, that. We, we I mean, do yeah. have our disagreements, and we we do have our. You guys our, both like alphas too. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. My wife, by the way, her birthday is June fourth. And my birthday is June 5th. Oh, gosh. So we're both Gemini. And they often say that the best match for a Gemini is another Gemini. But with this Gemini characteristic also comes the fact that, you know, she's right. And I think I, I'm right. And then we have that little challenge sometimes. But, you know, we've learned how to really work with one another. So she has strengths. I have strengths. She has weaknesses. I have weaknesses. And we're able to make it work. We collaborate. 
Uh, we have our moments where there's these disagreements, like any other marriage, yeah. but we're committed to it. Yeah. We're highly committed. We, we're raising a, a household. We have two beautiful boys. Uh, we have a great life. Well, you have the, the two most important things that I see. You know, you have, you know, love, trust, and respect Absolutely. of each other. You know, everything Absolutely. else can be worked out. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So when you yes. have those three things, man, you know, not, not, nothing, can, yeah. nothing can stop you, man. So, um, all right, so, you know, you're in a business. You're, you're the first Latino to hit a million dollars. You know, now, you know, you, you know, at the top of the food chain, you know, and you said the more successful you become, the hungrier you become, which is a rare, rare read. Most people are getting more complacent. They want to lay back and all that kind of stuff. Right. What's next for you? I mean, what I mean, I mean, what, what, you know, in the next five years, what's next for you? You're 50 years old. You know, you look like you're 30. Thank you know, you're you. literally like, like I said, you look 50. 20 years ago, and now that you're 50, you look 30. It's crazy. I, I'm serious, I'm being honest, you know what I mean? You oh, know, wow. and, and you, you literally have turned back the clock. You look so much better than you did when I, when I first met you, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Beautiful wife, you know, you know, mansion. You, you have everything going for you, right? Mm -hmm. So what's next? You know, when, what, what, what would be say, you know, you know, what would just complete your life and, you know, you know, in the next five or 10 years? Well, the reality right now is my life is complete. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm so grateful. I'm blessed that my life is the way it yes. is right now. It, if, if they were to stop time today, you know, so yep. I, I've lived an awesome life. Absolutely. Now, having said that, there's this, this feeling, this anticipation, this buzz, this sort of giddiness that is only going to get better. Mm -hmm. And how much better than what it is right now is going to get, we don't know, but the reality is there's so, mu so much more to go get. One of the things that would really make me happier and more fulfilled is that I could see the people that are, have worked with me and have stuck with me, some of the good people, that they get to this level. Yes. That they make their first million, their first two million, their first three million, their first five million dollars. That they are accumulating their net worth for their families, that they are completely fulfilled. The fulfillment part, that right? Happy, that yeah. they're happy that they basically got the world by the balls. I mean, yeah. that's, that's what you want to do. It's like, man, I, you look at all the areas of your life, and of course, all of them could use some improvement, but that you really have taken time to strategically improve the different compartments of your life so that they're better. <clears throat> yeah. That would be one of my big goals. Another thing is I want to really offer my kids the best opportunity for them to reach the goals from an athletic standpoint that I did. And of course, I'm not gonna force it on them. This is something that they've gotta love. Yeah. All I'm gonna do is provide. Provide the right tools the and foundation. The right tools, the right training, the right coaching, the camps, the tutelage in order for them to do it. Because my dad never supported my <laughs> athletic ambitions. He actually thought it was stupid. He says, hey, stop playing sports, go get a job. And then I did, but I still managed to play sports and yeah. he couldn't say anything about that anymore. But. I told my dad, I said, Dad, I'm gonna work for the rest of my life. Right now that I'm a kid, that I'm young, let me play, let me play sports, because I'm not gonna be able to play sports. But having said that, I still love to play sports. I go to the gym, I love basketball, and I love athleticism yep. and all that, and I still go there, and I still compete, yep. you know? Obviously not as, not as good as I used to before, but I beat most of them. I mean, you know what, man? For a 50-year-old multi-millionaire being in the gym, banging on basketball court with some with, with some 20-year-olds, man, I think you hold your own pretty well. Oh, yeah, and, and I beat most of them. Obviously, I'm still harder working than some of them. You yeah. can see some of them have had cheeseburgers and pizzas, yeah. and you can tell, you know, they're... You're just competitive by nature. I'm just you know I mean? super competitive. I, you, know, you know, I, I just, you know, a little bit I know, know about you is that you don't like to lose. You know what no. I mean? And, and if you lose, and you go back to a drawing board and you figure out a way to win and you come yeah, back and win. Absolutely. You know, this is, this is what I know about you all these years, man, and you know, and that's what winners all about. You might not have been undefeated, but you never beat, beaten twice with the same person. Well, that's, that's a good statement to make. Well, uh, what what's also next from a financial standpoint, you know, you, you got examples of people that have gotten to areas where, hey, where's the private jet? Well, that's one of my ambitions. We'll, we'll be getting a private jet. Uh, different homes throughout the world, that'd be pretty cool to say you go to different parts of the world yeah. and you got a, a different home there, obviously to grow your investment portfolio. I'd like to do that to increase my um, effectiveness to the marketplace where we'd be able to touch more people. There's someone out there right now that's 25 years old that's looking for someone like me that can say, man, I wish I'd had access to that guy. And, you know, we would be able to connect that. So therefore I can impact someone. I know life. I connected you to two. Absolutely. You know, and, 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 and I'm going to tell you, these two guys, you know, you know, the Sepulveda brothers, man, they're going to be superstars. They're hungry, you know, and, and, and it's almost like, you know, the perfect perfect player and the perfect coach and I can see some bright future in these kids man no doubt and I can you know I appreciate yeah. you taking one of your wings guys. I mean they, they're, they're, they're all about execution they're hungry mm -hmm. you know they're they they have the right attitude you know and man for me one of my fulfillments is I want to see them and you two it's like win championships 
You know what I mean? And, I, and I'm, I'm forever going, I'm going to be like, hey man, I introduced these guys, man. You know, you know and I, I can see it. I can see it in the next few years, these young guys, you know, you know become yeah. multimillionaires and, you know, come from a poverty and come from, you know, you know what, where they come from to, to that. And, and gosh, man, what a, what a story will that be? Oh yeah. yeah. And those stories are unfolding almost every month. All the time. Every month. There's a, the people that, people, it says money's not everything, but it really helps. You know, um, you know, Tony Robbins says that, um, you know, money doesn't buy happiness, you know, but it, 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 it helps you arrive at your problem in style, you know? <laughs> so, so I got some pictures here, Guillermo. So tell, tell me. me about, tell me about this picture here. Tell me, tell me about a picture on the left. Uh, this is a picture on the left. That's me and my wife. Mm -hmm. We actually got uh, recognized to be uh, put on a, on a billboard. Um, and this was right on the 60 freeway off of Fairway. There was the company held a contest. Mm -hmm. And that contest was won by me and my wife amongst, you know, 40, 50,000 uh, licensed people. And my wife and I qualify. I think we were like one of like six, seven people or so throughout the company. Mm -hmm. So that was a big honor. And our, um, our uh, face, our picture there was also posted on um, in uh, Times Square, New York City. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine I was born on a dirt floor in Psychotech, Mexico? You were in Times Square, New York City. And then my face, my picture of me and my wife was on Times Square, New York City. That That's just crazy. blows me away. Also, we're on billboards throughout um, here in Southern California. So that was a real cool thing. And uh, that's our photographer who took that. That's, that was the name of that, that a contest, Own Your Future. To the right there, that's actually one of our uh, Momentum Mondays where we get together once a month and uh, sort of do a recognition session for last month's performance. And these are all your agents? Uh, oh yeah, that's just a fraction of them. Holy. Yeah, that's a fraction. Holy. That's close to about 700 or so people right Holy. there back out the room. Gosh, We just man. had that meeting yesterday where this uh, gentleman, Danny Farias, um, did his talk and uh, it's, it's incredible, man. It's fascinating. <laughs> Wow, the life might, that you I might changed. invite you to one of these, so that way you Oh, can I would watch. love to. I okay. would love to, please. Perfect. Yeah. Because I would be honored. Um, okay, yeah. well, look at the boys. <laughs> okay. Look at those guys. Okay. So to the left there, my little man, Maximiliano. So <coughs> we were supposed to call him Max, M-A-X, but then his older brother couldn't say Max with an X for some reason, called him Mac. So now everybody calls oh, him Mac. Mac. So my little man right there, that's Mac. Uh, he's just, oh my God, he's a ball of energy. He's... Look, look at him. you can just tell by the little face and then Valentino is the sweetest, uh, just most likable boy out there. He's so, uh, he, they're awesome. And um, look at the, little, the picture there with our basketballs. Look at the little swag on the little one. <laughs> <laughs> you got the Jordans on or yeah, whatever so you got. I told him, hey, where's your game face? I said, it's time to show the game face. Like this. Yeah, there's a game face right there. So I installed a brand new basketball court for them there at the house. And uh, we go out there and we play, and um, Valentino uh, and his buddy from across the street, actually, I put it on my Instagram there, on my uh, story. Uh, they actually lost to the two nannies that were wearing chanclas, you know, sandals. So the two nannies versus the two kids, and the nannies beat them. And I, I recorded the whole thing, I, you know, I talked about it, and I told Valentino, I says, I'm gonna tell you about the story until you get good enough to beat to these beat freaking, them. Yeah, beat yeah, these that, freaking nannies. That. So he's like, oh, he was pissed. So and now that he knows that the world knows that, that they, that they lost. So that put better. me on blast. Oh yeah. So you talk about some fuel. You know. You know what I what I noticed. You know, just now. I don't know if you noticed or not. You know, is as soon as I brought these pictures, your whole tone changed. Really? Yeah. Your whole tone changed. Like I mean, you know, I don't think you noticed it, but like, you know, it's like you know, such a such a proud father. Like I can oh, I can man. tell like your whole your whole tone. Like you know, I can just tell like like I felt that you start talking through the gut. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's such a proud father. And, that, and I, know, I know a lot of people, when they, when they talk about my daughter, they say, like, I sparkle up. You know what I mean? And that's how you know that, you know, you know, it's, you know you're so proud of your children and, 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 and what you, you know, and how you're able to provide them the tools that you didn't have. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, yeah no doubt, man. You, you take, um, I pray to God for so long to give me my two little boys and look what he delivered to me. Yep. They're healthy. They're strong. You know, they're, they're misbehaving sometimes, but I actually love it. And, oh man, it's just, they're the joy of my life. I'm just so grateful that my wife was able to give me two boys. And they're, they're, you're with Lewis Howes and Ed Milet? Yes, sir. Awesome, man. I mean, I mean, you, you know, you've been around some of the top people. You are one of the top people. Thank you. You know what I mean? And, you know, you mentioned all the time, proximity is power. You know, you're, you know, you always surround yourself with people that you, you know, look up to and aspire to be like and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And one thing I noticed, I've known about you, you, 
you're humble enough when you don't know something to ask for help Absolutely. and to be able to coach. You know, I remember, you know, not too long ago, you know, you said, Sam, I want to, I want to, I want to, you know, even though you're in great shape, you know, you wanted to get in lower, better shape and you came over and we talked about, you know, a little diet program and exercise program and all that kind of stuff. Somebody, a lot of people, when they get to a certain level, you know, they think they know it all. And that's, I think that's the beginning of, of end, you, you know what I mean? And, and you're, you're humble enough to say, you know, Sam, I don't know too, too much about this. You might know a little bit. Let me have you help me and get some different insights. Mm -hmm. No and, doubt, yep. no doubt. By the way, I do that in all areas of my life. Yeah, I, can, I have my spiritual coach. My mom's a very spiritual person. So I go to her <clears> to help me understand things. As I, obviously, I don't know everything. And then I look at nutrition people, obviously health people, wellness people, financial people, um, uh, mental people. Like, how do you really, how do you, how do you learn how to be happy? Because a lot of people aren't happy. Yeah. There's a lot of pissed off people out there. Yeah. And, uh, and then there's a lot of people who latch on to things that, where they create anger within themselves over something that's not even worth not it. Even, yeah. Like, for example, on traffic, like someone cuts you off and then you got the people that are flicking off fingers and all that and they, they create this sort of animosity. It's like, let it go. Bro, you can't. Let it go. It's just, it's not worth it. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny, man. I've, I've learned to do that over the years and I would say, you know what? I can't control what I can't control. No. I can only be mad or upset of something that I can control of. But if I can't control something, you know, it, 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 I'm not going to get mad at it. Absolutely, so, yeah. And there's the wifey. There's the wife right there. So you guys got married what year? This was, uh, uh, we're supposed to get married 10, 10, 10. October 10th, 2010. Mm -hmm. And that would fall on a Sunday. And obviously the, the cathedral we wanted to get married in, they, they would have six masses that day. And you know, they, weren't, <laughs> they weren't having it. We're, they were going to host our wedding on a Sunday. So it turned out to be 10, 9, 10. So it was a Saturday and we got married October 9, 2010. So okay, so I'm, up on nine years. so I'm looking at that picture. I'm looking at your face. I'm looking at your face now. Like I said, you look younger now <laughs> than you did when you got married. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and um, had a few extra LBs on me right there. Huh? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, for sure. And, and, and when I first met you, you know, you had a few on top of that. Wow. You know what I mean, so, so I'm, I'm just looking at like your whole transformation, man. I mean, you know, it's great that, you know, you, you, you have done so well financially, but you got your family life together, you have your faith together, you have your fitness together, and you know, we know you have fun, man. We see your parties at the house and we see what you do for your family and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you are a true, true definition of a one percenter, man. I'm, and it's such an honor for me just to, just to see this, you know? Appreciate it, man. All right, so tell me what's, what's on the left and what's on the right. Uh, to the left here is my good friend. His name is Gustavo Vargas. He's an on-air personality with a Spanish <clears throat> station called KTNQ. And he asked me to go to his, uh, to his studio there in the west side. And he actually did a whole kind of like a, a briefing of this right mm -hmm. here over uh, uh, financial education, uh, financial literacy, uh, financial habits, um, how to get ahead. And he's actually done two or three of them with me and has really impacted the Spanish speaking uh, community out there. They're, I believe they're probably some of the people that need the most help since mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot aimed at them. Uh, people are trying to sell them something, but they don't really necessarily educate them. So we pride on the fact that through like a channel like this, we'd be able to reach out to people to educate them about financial matters. Especially the Hispanic market yeah, where, absolutely. you know, they're not Latino very well. Yep, yep. Yeah. yeah. Remember the word Hispanic has the word panic in it and we don't like that. Oh, okay. Got it. So, yeah. Okay. So Latino says, market. You see Hispanic is H-I-S. So his and then panic. <laughs> oh. So nothing with the word panic in it can be well, good. Yeah, it can be good. And then when you say his panic, you also say, well, what happened to her panic? Her panic. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Right. <laughs> so Latino, we like to refer them as... Is Latinos, Spanish speaking people. Awesome. And then to the right there, that's obviously me speaking at a company convention, um, 30, 30 to 40,000 people in the audience. And uh, the company selected me to go up on stage and talk about my business philosophy, my story, uh, some points that can inspire people to fight the fight, stay the course, become successful, and live and design a life on your terms. Okay, so for, for a regular person, that has a nine to five job, right? And that's what they're gonna do the rest of their life, you know? Well, if they choose to. If they choose to, right? right? You know, what would be your top five tips for somebody to create wealth? You know, uh, you know, you know, so for some people, you know, that are listening there and all, you know, and, and let's just say, you know, you know, let's just say they're, they're, they're only gonna make, you know, 50 to $100,000 a year mm -hmm. from here on. What would be your top five? 
For your average person out there? Yes. Um, there's two ways. One would be the slow pace, and one would be the, you know, obviously the carpooling. Okay, give, give me the slow pace first. So the slow pace, obviously, is get your finances in order to the point where you stop buying shit that you don't need, right? There's so many people out there trying to look rich, and they're going broke in the process of I was one so. of them. I, I, I've done that before. I've okay. done that before, well, yeah. a lot of people are doing that. Yeah. So stop trying to look rich while at, the, at the expense of going broke. Yeah. That's the first thing. Um, have a financial coach. Someone that will look at your personal finances and then cut out the fat and get on a pretty disciplined financial budget and then follow it. Okay. Do you really need cable? What about your Starbucks habits? Uh, happy hour. Do you smoke? Too much alcohol. All of these things cost money that are actually screwing yeah. you up. And yeah. by the way, there's people who charge up on their credit card to you know, go spend $200 at happy hour. Yeah. Now they got to pay interest on the two hundred dollars. It just it was unnecessary. Yeah. So people put themselves, you know, like you make your bed and then you lay in it. And it all becomes the discipline and the great and the gratification. Yeah. Okay. So we and I think constant uh, review of that and and someone that's willing to hold you to that. And you got you got that be, accountability. Yes, yeah. to be accountable and you've got to be willing to change your habits. They say if nothing changes, then nothing changes. Yep. Okay, so that'd be the first thing. The second thing would be is to um, put yourself in a position where you could actually work with someone to effectively help you from a tax perspective. <clears throat> There's so much out there. There's people that are not creating positive things for them in that space. So if you can get on a budget, if you can actually get a good tax person to help you with that side of it. Uh, the third thing would be is your, <clears throat> your investments or do you have any investments? Are you creating anything to get you to the top? There's so many people that are just concerned about getting out of debt, but then they're out of debt and then they start charging up new debt because yeah. they can't hold themselves back. So uh, a magic thing would be to pay yourself first. People have a list of bills. So look at it this way, Sam. Someone makes, say, $8,000 a month. Mm -hmm. They make $8,000 a month. That's roughly $100,000. Maybe 83, 33 is the exact number. So you make $100,000 a year and they go to work and they make this check, they bring that check home and all they do is pay bills. So they work to pay bills, mm -hmm. work to pay bills, work to pay, and they have that, they do that over and over again. So if I'm that person that says, the first person you must pay is yourself. Who's doing all the work? You. Yep. Who should get paid first? You. Yep. So we establish that concept of, isn't that unique? You do all the work, you should pay yourself first. So 10% of every dollar you make should be going to personal savings for retirement, mm -hmm. for yep. your own personal savings. Then you pay your bills. And if you establish that habit of paying yourself first, life goes on. Such a common sense, but to, nobody does it. Well, no, almost no one does it. Exactly. So people work to pay their bills first, and then there's nothing left for them. The richest man in Babylon, you know, finance one on one. Exactly. So it's yeah. just real simple. Yeah. But so we teach that, and through our model, through our concept, we get up on stage and we tell that to hundreds of people. And now a lot of the people that follow us on a consistent basis, they practice that. Like this Danny Farias I mentioned to you, he's up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars saved because he bought into the concept of pay yourself <clears throat> first. You get money coming into your life, the first 10% should go into your get rich account. Yes. Or at least that's what we call it. Because if you keep adding to it, you will get rich. Yes. You'll get in debt if you keep adding to it. So anything you fertilize and water will grow. Yes. So you got to fertilize and water your personal savings. This makes <clears throat> sense. So we do some of those things. Let's talk about the fast track. The fast track is use all the concept of the, the slow one, but now accelerated by increasing your income. Sam, it's been said that the gap between expenses and income is a wealth gap. Ex the gap between expenses and income, got it. Exactly. Well, so the bigger the gap, the bigger the wealth. Absolutely. So again, you have say $7,000 of expenses, you talk about your house, your car, your car insurance, your bills, your utility bills, your gasoline, food, etc. You have your expenses, and say they're seven thousand dollars, so it says you can't really cut a whole lot of those. You can't. You're not going to eat less. Yeah. No. Or probably most people don't eat less. You're not going to have less gas. So you already understand that these are the mandatory expenses of your life. Any expense above that would be now fat, and you need to cut out the fat. Mm -hmm. But any income above that now creates a wealth gap. So if you made fifteen thousand that month and your expenses are seven. Bro, you just created $8,000 that you now can take and effectively save yes. it. You got richer that month by $8,000. Yeah. Take that over the course of a year, the next year, three years. And then if you increase the income. And if you invest it properly or put in the right vehicle. No doubt, no doubt. But just the fact that you're saving it creates personal confidence. 
and it puts you in a position where life is turning out better for you because confidence is in large part the money, the amount of money you have saved. So true. Let me tell you a quick story, Sam. I learned that concept when I was in my 20s and I actually started doing it. So I sacrificed, I didn't have a lot of fancy stuff. I wasn't buying jewelry, I wasn't buying a lot of watches. I wasn't traveling, I didn't go to happy hour. I wasn't going to Vegas for bottle service. I didn't go to Coachella, I didn't go to <laughs> Rosario. So I, I, I sort of, I had this delayed gratification kind of life. Let me tell you what happened. So I, lived, I was living in Pomona in a one bedroom yeah. condo. Everybody hears a story. Living in Pomona in a and, one and this bedroom is, and, condo. And this is what you were already doing pretty well. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're, you're already doing pretty well. You're already you know, doing, pretty, already well. doing pretty, you know, pretty well, and you're like, you know, you're like, I'm, I'm good right now. Absolutely. So I lived in a one bedroom condo on Town Avenue in Pomona. My mortgage payment was $515 a month, and my homeowner association is like a buck twenty-five, and then I had my gas bill was like eight bucks, and then you know, all my phone bill, my cell phone, my my gas. So a thousand dollars all in. So I'm in. I'm probably my living expenses were maybe I don't know three, four thousand dollars. By the way, and then I had my office rent and my assistant, and so you know, invest in your business. But that month I had made like eighty-five thousand dollars, somewhere around there. So I made eighty-five thousand dollars, and my expenses were five thousand. <laughs> so I had so $80,000 of money that I would take. Of course, you got to pay your taxes, so that yeah. brings it down. But let's suppose it's, say, fifty. Yeah. So I'd save $50,000 that month. You have any idea how fast your net worth yes. can grow and your yep. savings can grow and your confidence yep. and your ability to now show people, say, hey, I'm doing it. And now we look at it as I still do that with larger amounts, yep. but now I don't hold back on anything that I want. So I now have both worlds. I have the things that I want. Like, uh, there's not a whole lot of material stuff I want that I don't have, yeah. other than a private jet, maybe. I'm not interested in buying a yacht, but just, just a private jet. But they'll come to the point where your savings and your investments are doing so well and they're, they're big, and you can also have the things you want. You know, we don't compromise on food. We don't compromise on, my wife has a, her, her budget that I give her every month for her expenses. It's pretty healthy. You can see on her Instagram all the stuff she has. And so, and then my kids, you know, I don't, I don't hold back on anything like that. So, so stop there for a second. Yeah. You know, so, so you just said something here right now that, that, you know, I wanted to know, right? So, you know, obviously we know, you know, you do very well. You know, you make more in one month than most people make in five years. You know, <laughs> most average people make in five years, right? You know, um, you know, um, definitely you make more in one month than 90% of people make in a year. We know that, right? Um, do you still operate at a budget? Do you still operate at a budget? Do you say, okay, well, you know what? You know, you know, you know hey, this is a budget you know, for a household. This is a budget for this. Or does it come to a point and you're like, you know what? You know, we make so much that I don't really need to have a budget, you know, you know but I, I kind of want to stay within this range. Um, by nature, I'm a negotiator, Sam. You, you, you know mm -hmm. that, you know that from me from, yeah. from the beginning, that never has gone away. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you like to control, you know, you know, yes, and, and I, that's what, and that's what I, because that, I struggle with that. I'm, I'm, I'm not asking for you, I'm asking for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Here's what you I, know, I, I want to have that conversation with my wife. Yeah. You know what I <laughs> mean? You know, I want to have that conversation with my wife because I'm like, you know, you know, because, you know, because if you don't watch it, if you're not aware of it, yeah. next thing you know, it goes all over the place. Yeah. And next thing you know, it's like, you know, it is this insane amount of money that's just gone nowhere and we don't, we can't account for it. Yeah. There's a thing, there's a thing that I've watched real successful people do <clears throat> where they start becoming sloppy and wasteful. And we see it all over the place. Someone gives up to a certain amount of money, they make half a million dollars or they make a million dollars and they think that's a lot of money. I used to think that was a lot of money. It's like, oh, I made a million dollars. That's a lot of money. Uh, you can tell us tell where their thoughts are. I mean, we see it, we see it all the time. You know, Mike Tyson thought he had a lot of money. Oh, you know, MC Hammer thought a lot of money. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we all know one thing. You can always spend more than you have. I don't care who you are. No matter. Exactly. You know, I don't care so, who you are. I'm always watching out for that. Uh, and let me tell you, too, um, I still have no problem shopping at discount places. And wherever I shop, I still ask for a discount. I go to a, so oh man so you didn't single me out twenty years ago man you trying to get a discount for personal training <laughs> <laughs> I came in man negotiated I'm like what the hell you know so yeah it's just it's just a pattern that I, and it served me very well but let me tell you the distinction though so let's suppose I go buy an item for example I go buy a car say a car is a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars and then I negotiate it down to say ninety well then I saved ten thousand dollars right yeah. but did you really save it? So I still pay $100,000, 90 for them, 100 for my savings. 
I mean, 10 for my savings. Yeah. You with me? Yeah. So I still do save it. So I've held on to that pattern over and over again that if I negotiate something, by the way, I do deals with hotels, I do deals with uh, merchants, vendors, all sorts of stuff. And that says, okay, what's the price? And then I negotiate that down and say if it's 10, 15%, whatever it is. And I take that amount and it says, well, I actually save that due to my ability to negotiate. You know, I love that about you, man. I love that about you. And I want to be like you. And I want to, you know, you know, I want to, you know, I'm, I'm learning so much here. I mean, I'm, I'm taking so much mental notes from you right now. Mm-hmm. And I, for the, those of the guys that are watching this, man, I mean, if, if this is some huge amount of knowledge bombs, man, I mean, like for you to take, just take what he just said, mm-hmm. you know, just apply some of the things, you know what I mean? It's just incredible to know somebody that is at your level, you know, is so disciplined. You know, he's so disciplined. Not only, like I said, you're so successful. When more, you get more successful, you're hungry, which is just, you know, it's, it's totally opposite of what everybody else Absolutely. does. But you still stay disciplined. And, you know, when I was talking to, you know, Tim Grover, you know, you know, you know him very well. He spoke at your event. Yep. And he spoke so highly of you. And he said, your event was just one of the best ones he's ever been to, which is no surprise. You know, I see the events that you put on. Um, you know, he said that when Michael Jordan, after every game, when he played 48 minutes, he went to Michael Jordan and says, six, seven, or eight. And that meant, what time we practice in tomorrow? 6 a.m., 7 a.m., or 8 a.m. Now this could be at 11 o'clock at night, he played 48 games, you know, 48, 48 minutes, minutes straight, mm-hmm. you know, and now he's, you know, he's still going there. And he said, every practice, Michael Jordan, the greatest player of all time, slam dunk champion, you know, he said, every practice, he started with 100 chest passes, the most basic movement. So he wasn't doing 360 slam dunks or, you know, behind the neck, you know, throw ups, or he stuck to the fundamentals, the fundamentals. you know what I mean? And it sounds yes. like you are like the Michael Jordan of finances, even though you are at the top of the food chain and you're, you, you know, you're doing so well, still there are fundamentals that you can't ignore. And I think when people start getting fancy, whether it's in sports or whatever it, whatever it is, they start ignoring the fundamentals, that's the beginning of the end. Absolutely. There's nothing like keeping it basic, keeping it simple, keeping the right example for the beginner. <clears throat> You know, speaking about Michael Jordan is he would always give his best, even though they were blowing the team out by 30 points or they were losing. He still gave it his best because, hey, that little kid in the audience probably saved his last dime to come see me that one time in his life. And that guy shouldn't be cheated out of me watching the less. So I look at that. Um, I I go to every every one of my meetings and one of my functions and I try to bring my A game every single time. It could be that new associate, that new person that's looking to hear Guillermo Haro speak. Should they get less than what they bought for? Yeah. Than what they bargained for. Just profound, man. Just profound. I mean, this, this is one of the best interviews I've done, especially when it comes to finances, man. I mean, I mean, it's just, it's just you know, it's incredible amount of knowledge, man. So for the people who are listening right now, mm-hmm. you know, where can they find you? Can you, can you tell them exactly, you know, where to find you? You know, I'm tell all them all your place. handles. Okay? Yeah, I'm all over the place. First of all, would be Instagram, Guillermo Haro 33. That's my Instagram page. I'm all over Facebook, Guillermo Haro. I have a YouTube channel, Guillermo Haro Team Conquer. I have that. And then we have, uh, we're reconstructing our, um, our uh, uh, site where people are gonna be able to go there and then get all of my updates and be able to buy stuff on there. My wife's got a line coming out for leggings and stuff. I don't know if you heard about yeah, that. Yeah, she was talking to me yeah, about so it. She's yeah. got, so we're, we got a lot of things in the works right now. We're just really excited about things that are happening for us. Um, potentially, I've uh, talked to some people. We have, may have a um, of my brand, my GH brand. Uh, by the way, it's Go Hard. Oh, I yeah, like Go that. Hard. So it's Guillermo Mahara, but it's Go Hard. Go Hard. Yeah, Go Hard. And which is basically what I've done for 20 years. I've go hard every single day. Go mm-hmm. hard and go consistent. Yeah, I mean, consistently. You know, yes. you apply what you did to me 20 years ago, which negotiate. You know, you exactly. know, you know, and now you know you're 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 20 extra income, and you still negotiate. Yeah. You stuck to the fundamentals. Absolutely. You know, you never. You know, it's, I'm I'm just blown away. So one of my things too is we have a project going out there too, where I'm, I'm going to try to look into that. Uh, in Mexico, we have some. Uh, contacts and I'm trying to come out with a tequila brand with my go hard and that, that, that. is go hard and then we're going to have some premium tequila out there something to rival like the stuff that's out here from a real Mexican not not someone who's Dude, not Mexican trying I to sell can't, tequila. you know you know I cannot wait I mean I mean I'm you know you know who else will be better at that you know than you I think you have the story you're a real Mexican. I'm a real you know, Mexican. And, and, and we know, we know not only you go hard, you go hard in everything. Mm-hmm. You know how to work hard. You know how to play hard. You know how to have fun. You know, you know, you have your faith in place, family, fitness, finance, fun, true one percenter. Guillermo, it's, it's an honor, you know, someone of your caliber 
coming to the house, you know, you know, sharing the story with me, you know, and, and knowing that, you know, it wasn't all given to you. This is something that you came in with a very humble beginnings. You know, your parents risked their lives for you. Mm -hmm. You know, they did the best that you could do. And you just went, you saw an opportunity. And after that, you never looked back. And after it. Yep. Uh, God bless you, man. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank all you. Right.